This patient had an upfront surgical debulking, which really for the longest time has been the standard of care. And it's always been our goal to get down to what we call an optimal disease status. Uh, there are some important changes that have happened as we've learned even more about ovarian cancer and how we can treat our patients the best. So we know that it's very important to get down to an R0 uh, status. Patients with R0 resections clearly do better than patients who have optimal disease or where the greatest nodule is uh, one centimeter or less, or patients who have suboptimal uh, disease status. So essentially whatever we can do to get the patient down to that R0 status is worth doing. Now, we sometimes will use neoadjuvant chemotherapy in these settings and we have uh, four trials now, international trials, suggesting that patients who have neoadjuvant therapy with interval cytoreductive surgery um, really do just as well as patients who have uh, upfront debulkings. Now, the key with this patient is that she really doesn't have the high-risk criteria that would make her the best candidate for neoadjuvant with interval cytoreductive surgery. In other words, she doesn't have uh, pleural, malignant pleural effusion. She doesn't have parenchymal liver metastases. She doesn't have apparent bulky disease that would keep you from getting an R0 resection. And she has a good performance status and can tolerate that upfront surgery. So I agree that in this patient, I would have proceeded with, a, with an upfront debulking surgery just like she had. You know, if she had any of those other high risk issues, if I didn't think that I could get her down to an R0 resection, um, or if her performance status couldn't tolerate a massive surgery, then that I think is the role of neoadjuvant therapy in a patient like this. When we see patients who have an upfront uh, debulking procedure, uh, patients with an advanced, so like this patient, a stage 3C ovarian cancer, the old school way to treat this patient would really be straightforward IV paclitaxel and carboplatin. But really the field has changed. We have so much more information that helps guide us in how we treat our patients now that that is rarely enough. That's really the right thing to do. So um, when we consider frontline therapy for patients, I think that the first question to ask is, can you debulk the patient appropriately um, or are they candidates for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And if they're candidates for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, then that's where you would use your IV paclitaxel carboplatin for three to four cycles ahead of surgery. I think that whether you get down to that optimal disease status with neoadjuvant um, and interval debulking, or as in this case, um, with an upfront debulking, then we really uh, guide our treatment based on that germline and somatic testing uh, result. So in other words, if the patient is uh, BRCA positive, uh, so do they have a mutation either germline or somatic in a BRCA or related mutation or not? Because that's gonna really guide your decision uh, for use of a PARP inhibitor versus uh, are you going to use bevacizumab in this patient? In, in other words, if she doesn't have um, a BRCA mutation, if she doesn't have a somatic mutation in either BRCA or a related mutation, or if she has really uh, widespread uh, disease, uh, so a so-called high-risk patient or, or poor prognosis patient, then that's the patient where I'm going to think about incorporating bevacizumab into her upfront uh, treatment strategy and then carrying it out in terms of maintenance therapy. So I think those are the sort of the top two strategies uh, for determining what I'm going to use. Now, you know, this patient had intravenous uh, and intraperitoneal chemotherapy with bevacizumab. And I, I will say that that's something that I'm, uh, I don't personally often uh, use that exact strategy. Um, I think I tend to reserve patients, uh, reserve intraperitoneal therapy for my patients who have BRCA mutations. Um, because when we look at the cohorts in uh, 218 and ICON-7, it really appears that the subgroups of patients who do the best are the patients with BRCA-related mutations. Um, it, in the absence of that, 
bevacizumab can usually make up for that difference.